This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, host of the original Southern Remedy, the show where I answer your medical questions. Subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on any podcasting app. Good morning and thanks for tuning in today. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Joining me today, I have Dr. Mark Livingston, DDS, who's the Chair of Advanced General Dentistry, also at UMMC. And we're really going to be exploring the connection between your overall health and your oral health today. So if you have dentistry questions that you would like to ask our dentist, you can always email me, fit at mpbonline.org. Good morning, Dr. Livingston. Good morning. How are you doing today? I am doing pretty good for a Monday. I'll take it. <laughs> That's what I always say. I can't believe they gave me a show on a Monday, but uh, it's a good way to kick off the week. And you've been on the show before, but it's been several years since Correct. you were on. So we're very glad to have you back. Why don't we start with what is advanced general dentistry? What does that actually mean? Sure. In the School of Dentistry, our department houses uh, a general dentistry residency program. Uh, from the medical side, it'd be almost like an internship in that it's a one-year program. Uh, a lot of these students are going out in the private sector. Some of our students are going on for further residency mm-hmm. training, but uh, you can't join our residency program until you graduate dental school. So there's where the advanced yeah. thing comes in. Um, our our residents do rotations with the emergency department, anesthesia, uh, pediatric dentistry. So we're trying to pick up uh, kind of a spoiler alert. Some of the stuff we'll talk about later, introducing these former dental students, now they're our colleagues, into this wider world of very medically complex Mm -hmm. people. Um, As you well know, Josie, here in Mississippi, we have uh, a theme of (laughs) of several, you know, medical illnesses. Yes. mm -hmm, That that kind of run, Mm -hmm. you know, common things happen commonly. So uh, preparing them to go out in the private sector and not just treat the healthy patient, be able to expand your skill set and treat those patients that have a wide range of medical problems uh, just makes you a better servant of your fellow Mississippian. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the way you and I met was working through what's called Dental Missions Week, which is um, actually my my favorite event that, that happens at UMC. But it is happens every year. Usually, what, first week of February, somewhere right around, around there. there. Mm-hmm. And it's where folks who are uninsured or underinsured from a dental standpoint can come to the School of Dentistry and get um, get the care that they need. And it's mm-hmm. usually things like cleanings or fillings or pulling some teeth, that kind of stuff, some root canals, right. that kind of thing. Uh, and I got invited to participate in this wonderful event as the medical... An opportunity an to aper- expand <laughs> your... Exactly. Servitude to your fellow Mississippians. That's a great way to put it. Probably, gosh, probably seven years ago, seven or eight years yeah. ago, somewhere like that, um, as kind of the medical partner for this. And what I love about that is the fact that it really is highlighting that the medical side of things, what we tend to think of when we blood pressure and blood sugar and uh, medicines that you're on and all those kinds of things are directly linked to your oral health and what we can safely do for you from a dental standpoint. And I did not know half of the things I know now about Mm -hmm. oral health when we started that partnership. And it's usually you and I uh, in what we call medical triage, which is where everybody starts when they come in for Dental Missions Week. uh, And we see them to make sure that they are safe to go back and get uh, whatever dental care is going to need to be done. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we started, I was like, what would make somebody not safe, right, to go back and do those things? And it really was learning what happens in the dental chair, because as a a medical provider, we kind of get used to going, oh, that's the dentist will take care of that. So Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, you know, we'll get you set up with the dentist. But learning what the role 
um, of both of those things together is, and if your blood pressure is too high, you may not be able to get dental work done, right? Or if your blood sugar is too high and we need to pull a whole bunch of teeth, it's probably not going to happen because you may not heal well. Correct. All of those different kinds of things together. So kind of lay that out for me. Like what is the the big connection between physical health and oral health? Because sure. it's all just health. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of people get uh, upset, if you will. They come in for an appointment. We can't see you today. Your blood pressure is too high. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, I took off work or I had to arrange care for my kids or X, Y, or Z. And we're, we're not trying to be difficult, right. but in what world does sitting in a dental chair make your blood pressure go down? Definitely not mine because I get rather anxious in the dental chair. A lot of people do, okay, because, well, we're right there in your face, yeah. okay? So personal space issues, <laughs> one. Two, there's this fear of the unknown. Is it going to hurt? Is it, uh, how long is this going to take? Uh, in today's economy, how much is it going to cost? Right. So there's all these uh, layers. What are all those noises? That's <laughs> right. Well, yeah. And and then we crank up a drill that doesn't sound appealing. It's right. not Mozart, for sure. Um, so you've got all these layers of anxiety. And that's ramping you up. You came in from the car. You walked, you know, because of parking, uh, a couple hundred yards to yeah. get here. Let's say it's July in Mississippi, and it's a lovely 103 in the shade. Yes, just balmy. So they come in, and that blood pressure, uh, you know, everybody, every practitioner's got exact cutoffs for what they feel they can pull off. So, right. again, we're going to talk in generalities right. today. absolutely. But usually... Uh, the high end 140, the low end uh, diastolic of 100 is kind of where we say we're kind of getting out of our safe zone. Right. Um, especially for the unmedicated patient because they don't have any medication on board to buffer. Right. If that blood pressure wants to zoom up when we start an injection or we start or they start, uh, you know, hearing the drill or whatever. So there are times when those numbers can be in excess of 140 over 100 and we might be able to do something because it might be a simple procedure. It might be a post-op or something that's not really going to involve a lot of uh, invasive care. Right. Or we have a long track of working with this patient and we know by collaborating with someone like you that's mm-hmm. doing their general medicine, hey, they're on these three medications. This is as good as they get. Right. We're not getting any better. So. This is it. If you can't treat them today, then you probably can't treat them, period. Right. Which is absolutely not what we want. It's not what we want, but sometimes that's what we're, that's, that's what, what yeah. my group right. <laughs> gets the referral, and that's what you have to deal mm-hmm. with. And so now you're looking at maybe nitrous oxide, Mm -hmm. some other form of sedation, your chair side skills, uh, kind of, you know, ironic we're here on the radio, but you go for that jazz late night DJ voice. Exactly. You You don't want to come in shotgunning information at them. (laughs) You slow it down. You put your hand on their shoulder. You use those communication skills to try and, if not bring it down, Mm -hmm. buffer it going up. So there's there's a certain amount uh, a, a bit of uh, you know I don't want to say snake oil but there's a certain amount of patient uh, management yeah. that goes into this as well. So you know uh, and then talking about uh, blood sugar being too high or way too low, right. both have their own set of problems. But um, patients with blood sugars, their blood glucose of over four hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will heal, but they heal about at the same pace as glaciers move. Yeah. You know, it is just crazy how slow the healing is. And so that makes that healing process where someone without that problem might heal from an extraction or heal from their gum surgery in a couple of weeks. This stretches out like a couple of months. Mm-hmm. And it starts really becoming problematic because now you have exposed bone for a longer period of time. Right. You have to alter your diet for a longer period of time. And you're already diabetic, so you need to be on a certain diet. And now this is problematic. Right. Plus, with our diabetic patients, as they start losing teeth, you and I have both seen this so many times, um, the more teeth 
a diabetic patient loses, the less uh, effective their chewing function is. Right. Now they're moving towards this softer, typically carbohydrate-rich diet. And simple carbohydrate-rich, not not the uh, the leafy, chewy, fibrous vegetables that we want you to be having. No, I, I'm pretty sure it's not like whole grains that we're going with. No, it's with more, here. you know, mashed potatoes or you know soft bread, those Pro- types of things that are going to be easy to to gum through right. and and be able to swallow and without disparaging any producer of anything uh processed right sugar processed flour whatever and while that in and of itself in in a small bubble is not bad but if you're living off that right. and you've already got diabetes it's your job trying to help them control is going to be so much harder it's insane yeah you know, so so there's that problem. Um, we we are hesitant, unless it's an abscess, unless it's kind of getting into that acute emergent. We're hesitant to do a lot of elective stuff when someone's glycemic control is is out of whack, for lack of a better term. This morning, um, low blood sugar makes me nervous because is that person when they get stressed going to lose consciousness on me? Right. A lot of times, our chronic diseases come along with how many trips around the sun you've had okay right. as as i near aarp <laughs> property myself you are a spring chicken i wish i felt like a spring chicken but anyhow um yeah the uh, stringy old turkey may be closer but uh so you've got these older patients and a lot of times what what makes this happen i don't understand people have it their regimen about their pills. Oh, but I'm running a little day late to get to the dentist. So they take their pills, they take their insulin, they forget to eat. Yeah. Now they show up here in our office. We're going to stress them. They're going to have this long appointment. Right. And that blood sugar is steadily tripping down. And so what we're watching for is, you know, is their cognitive state degrading? All that. Plus, again, if they're a more mature crowd, are we going to have a slip and fall? Right. Okay. Because as you and I well know, that that's the thing that makes me really nervous about the low blood sugar mm-hmm. is can they be ambulatory? Absolutely. Because a slip and fall. Uh, that's a whole pile that we don't, you know, that we, we don't want to have that for you. Absolutely. We're, we're wanting to make sure that as best we can, it's, a, it's an anxiety producing encounter, no doubt about it. But can we get you through this appointment with the least bit of anxiety on your part uh you don't go away with more problems than you started right out with. absolutely yeah so so those things make us very nervous uh on on the hypertension side and on diabetes uh and there there's some other areas that we kind of figure into Thanks for tuning in today. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, joined today by Dr. Mark Livingston, who is uh, a dentist also at UMMC. And we've been talking about really the connection between oral health and physical health and that they're really all rolled up into one and kind of uh, interact with each other. Mark, Let's let's take it way back to just some general questions. Like, sure. how often are we supposed to be coming to see guys like you in dentistry? Sure. Assuming no unusual circumstances, we can circle back to that in a moment. <laughs> Average person, you're going to see your hygienist twice a year, every six okay. months. They're at the dentist office. Okay. If they find anything, they elevate it up to the dentist. Um, pending no unusual findings, then the uh, there's going to be an annual recall exam with me mm-hmm. to pronounce you healed or, <laughs> hey, here's some things right. that we need to address. Right. All right. Um, going back to our diabetic patient, because uh, diabetes impacts your immune system, gum disease becomes more prevalent so with those patients, they may be asked to return for a cleaning every four months, mm. every three months, if it's really aggressive. Uh, patients that are on uh, organ rejection mm, drugs. So they've had a transplant. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, in 
any type of medication that would impact your immune response puts you at more um, more risk for gum disease. Uh, lots of times, uh, for the most part, our risk for tooth decay is a huge direct correlation to our diet. How many times during the day are you exposing yourself to simple sugars? Right. Because then you ramp up those bacteria that cause tooth decay and you get them at an excited, elevated level. Now, if we do it sparingly across the day, then you only have a few peaks. But if you're constantly sipping on mm -hmm. something, again, not, not disparaging any particular producer of anything, just saying if you're... If you're sipping on soda, mm -hmm, you know. That's... that's <clears throat> got simple sugars right. in it, you're keeping those bacteria at that at that. It's like a element. buffet for mm -hmm. the, the bacteria. They are really going to town. Mm -hmm. And one of the byproducts of that is acid, which starts dissolving your teeth, starts the process going. Um, you know, there's a, like I said before the show, there's a whole lot of microbiology involved in that that exceeds my pay, pay grade by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, that can be very problematic. So what we're doing, you know, is basically trying to take a risk stratification mm -hmm. for that patient and design a recall system for them. Mm -hmm. So it may be more than every six months. Uh, again, like I say, talking in generalities today, your physician and your dentist and you. Your team, yeah. Your team collaborates and you guys figure out what's best for your individual situation. Right. But there are times when... The every six months doesn't quite get it done. Right. But that's kind of the, the minimum. Every that's, six months we need to be in. And I think a lot of times people go, well, you know, I, I brush my teeth twice a day. I floss, although I would say that they're probably lying to you when they tell you that they floss because I think a lot of people don't do that like they're supposed to. But anywho, why would I need, you know, like what what is the dentist or the dental hygienist going to do differently than what I'm doing at home? Right. Okay, so we start out, we go out, we have a meal. The left behind of that meal that sticks to our teeth starts out as plaque. It's gooey, it's soft, it can potentially be removed with brushing and flossing. Over time, uh, calcium ions from our saliva, other things from the saliva, help that turn into something fairly hard. Mm -hmm. We call it calculus because it's like the class. It's right. hard. It's hard, yes. Okay. Um, common, you know, term, tartar. Tartar, mm -hmm. right. Right. Now, that you can brush till you wear the bristles off that brush. <laughs> and it's and, not coming off. Not really. Mm -hmm. Now, what that tartar becomes is a condominium for bad bacteria. Mm -hmm. To just move in and... Set up shop, they're hanging out, they're living the good life. They've got neighbors down the hall they party with. It's it, it's great for them. Right. It's bad for you. Right. So when you go to the hygienist and they uh, break out all the armamentarium we talked uh -huh. about on all break the, as all well. All the tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're, um, I know they'll cringe when I say the word, scraping. Mm -hmm. But what they're doing is breaking up that biologic uh, hard material mm -hmm. that's housing so much of those bacteria and preventing you from removing as as that stuff builds up it's hard and it's also very porous so now the new plaque mm -hmm. smears on that makes another layer makes another layer gotcha. incrementally building up so now you've got to come in with something above and beyond what the average layperson has got in their mm -hmm. home to flake that off. Right. And so now you get back to a baseline that you can brush, mm -hmm. you can floss, you can maintain your hygiene all over again. Gotcha. Gotcha. So is there a better brush? Like, is it, what's the secret to a good toothbrush? Typically, we're going to go with a soft bristle. Which is, so as a non-dental person, right? Counterintuitive. Right. Like in my head, I'm like, I need something stout to get all that stuff off of there. So I'm going to get like a medium or hard bristle, but you're saying that's not what we should do. Probably not. Uh, long and the short of it is sometimes folks think more elbow grease right. is better. 
and they're literally sanding away Ooh. gum tissue. Oh, we don't want to do that. Incrementally. Don't do that. In small, but over years, it starts right. to build up. Absolutely. And once you've lost it, it's really hard to get it back, and it is neither easy nor cheap to put exactly. it back. Exactly. Now you're looking at potentially a surgical procedure mm-hmm. to build that back. So we want to go with a soft bristle toothbrush. Okay. And if that is not getting it done, if you have material that stays on after that, that means maybe it's time for that cleaning okay. at your dental office. Okay? What about electric toothbrushes? Are those like hype fine. or are those work good? They're fine. Okay. Uh, Whatever is, you'll use. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, it's like what toothbrush works, the one you use. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. That mm-hmm. that old adage is very true. It's like, what fruit should I eat? Whatever you can afford and you enjoy, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And now what about floss? Um, do we need the on-the-roll floss or the little the little pick ones that have the floss loaded on there? Are Whichever those good one to I can con you into using exactly. is, is acceptable <laughs> by me. Um, you know, again, toothbrushes, whether manual or electric, pressure be careful don't start sanding your gums if your gums are sore really sore lighten up the pressure a little bit gotcha on the floss in and out you're not buffing your shoes okay easy on the way yeah don't saw into the gums that up down lots of up down not so much the back forth back forth like like we're trying to saw through prison bars uh kind of thing so that that's the big thing there um you know should you floss before you brush or after you brush i would go with after you brush okay um but that's just me uh i'm sure somebody one of my colleagues will call in and go no no it should that's not the right answer so what that means to me is whenever you remember to do it is the the right time to do it if you like to do it before hand that's fine if you want to do it after that's fine too i'm sure there's a reason to get into the minutia Mm -hmm. but as long as we can get the patients to do it right because again what you're doing you're disrupting the building of tartar that's the most like important the, part. the condo that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. We're just knocking down the foundation of it every time we go we're in and do that. We're making them start over gotcha. and over and Starts over. the clock ticking again on exactly. those kinds of things. Go back. Wonderful. Yeah, you're resetting the dial. Exactly. So, um, but point being is doing it versus the minutia of exactly when. Right. I, I tend to less dogmatic about that these days the older i get the longer i'm in practice the fact that somebody's doing it i I go okay that's a win Mm -hmm. yeah and y'all can tell right like if if you ask us if we're flossing and we say yes and you get in there you can tell right typically between the physical exam and the radiographs (laughs) we're going to be polite and go so don't lie to your dentist they know we'll, we'll probably come back with the and I'm going to need you to be a little better right. about that. Right. You Absolutely know. there. You know. What about mouthwash? Is that something that we should be doing or is that a gimmick? Uh, well, never hurts. You mm-hmm. know, uh, obviously we're dealing with people every day. If you feel more confident making sure that, you know, I had a little too much garlic in <laughs> the lasagna right. or whatever, whatever makes you feel more confident, great. Um, we need to be careful about using it sparingly, especially if it's uh, containing alcohol, because it can mm-hmm. dry out the tissues. Right. Um, so, and and how uh, caustic mm-hmm. a material mm-hmm. are we using? Mm-hmm. You know, if it makes your gums sting, uh, kind of be careful about okay. it. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, also, I don't have a geographic map memorized or anything like that. If you're in a non-fluoridated water supply. You may want to talk to your dentist about getting a fluoride brush on supplement Mm -hmm. that you can use like right when you go to bed. Brush it on your teeth, spit out the excess, let that coating stay on your teeth while you Mm -hmm. sleep. That way you're not going to be eating something in the near future or drinking something and washing it off the teeth. So, again, forgive my ignorance about which counties. Well, usually um, if you're on well water, it's not going to be fluoridated. Like I grew up on well water. It it was not. Um, uh, Sometimes in a lot of the more rural counties, um, Delta counties, that kind of stuff, the the water Mm. will not be fluoridated. So that's something that you need to to find out. And you can actually find that out on the health department website. You can Mm -hmm. can go and look and it'll show you whether your water is fluoridated or not, and so whether you need kind of that sealant that you kind of brush on at nighttime or not there. Because I'm assuming, what does that fluoride do? 
Uh, it helps strengthen the enamel. Okay. And it also helps inhibit bacterial growth. Okay. So it's it's gonna it's gonna fight. Talking about those bacteria being in an excited state, they're producing a lot of acid. It's gonna buffer that. Gotcha. It's gonna help kind make, of calm it all down a little bit. It will cause less damage. Gotcha. Gotcha. You're, you know, as so much in medicine, we're trying to mitigate right. bad things. Right. It's hard to go over like a light switch and turn the problem off. But we can lower the, the risk of something bad that, happening. We can grab uh, I, the light switch, dimmer switch is an analogy I use almost daily. We're just trying to dial it down to an acceptable right. level right. that we can live with. Right. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm Josie Bidwell here with Dr. Mark Livingston, and we're talking all about your teeth today. So anything related to oral health, we're happy to talk with you. We do have open lines. All right, Dr. Livingston, you and I have uh, known each other for a long time, and we have gotten to work together on medically complex patients that need dental work done. And so I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about what that means, uh, why dental care is important, even when you have a lot of other chronic medical issues going on, Mm -hmm. and how we do that safely. Sure. Uh, First thing, uh, patients that need their heart valves replaced, Mm -hmm. whether the heart valve became damaged uh, by bacteria or whether it's a congenital, anything like that. Or it just gave out, because sometimes they do. <clears throat> Any of the above. Uh, you're, you want to make sure you don't have some teeth that are in the ver- on the verge of abscessing mm-hmm. or about to become acute. Because, okay, you go through this very invasive procedure of getting this new heart valve. Now, all at once, you have this abscessed tooth. The bacteria can spill over into the bloodstream and potentially infect that new valve, which means you get to go and have that lovely experience all over again. Okay, so we've got these very learned, uh, amazing surgeons, you know, both at UMC and at plenty of other places. Um, But what they can't do is follow you around like your mama (laughs) and, 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 you know, hey, and I'm like, hey, you need to be doing this. This, yeah. this, you've got to take some ownership of your own health. Right. Okay, so um, we really impress upon people that if you're about to have a some kind of cardiac procedure, whether it be with us, your hometown dentist, whoever, just go get a checkup. Make sure that nothing's about to run off the rails. Okay, right. um, and it's not that you shouldn't have the small little cavity fixed because it's always better to get something fixed when it's small. Right. It's faster and cheaper when it's small. Pretty much a, a, a true across many, mm-hmm. many parameters there. But really looking for those teeth that could uh, have a large cavity that could abscess on you right. at a critical point in time while you're trying to heal from that heart surgery. That's when it, life gets tough for you. And it really, you know, not, not saying that we're more important than the patient. We're not. We're there in service of the patient. But now... You're making your cardiac surgeon and I go, we're scratching our heads right. going, how do we do this? How do we make the, how do right. we get them back to a good spot? Right. So it's great to get it, you know, an ounce of prevention, pound of cure, that, mm-hmm. that's a reoccurring theme over the next few minutes kind of thing. So our cardiovascular surgeon uh, patients, uh, that's a, a very important patient pool to go through and get that checkup, make sure you're okay before this happens and then your dentist and that surgeon can collaborate on yeah that probably needs to be taken care of before the surgery or no that's not going to be that big a deal we can wait a few months till you're healed Mm -hmm. and then we can move forward with this care right so forth so on but then at least there's the option now we've had that discussion and we haven't had something jump up in an untimely fashion right and I usually say, you know, when I'm working with patients on the, the medical side, if this is a non-urgent procedure that we're going to do, so it's not a car accident that we've got to go in and, and repair something or a gunshot wound or something, if it's ele- needs to happen but elective as to when we do it, then if we're going to be putting something in you that you did not originally come into the world with, 
then we need dental clearance for mm-hmm. that. Um, for me, that usually is joints. Um, I work with a lot of patients who need a joint replacement, mm-hmm. usually either a hip or a knee. And they come to see me to usually lose a little bit of weight or get their blood sugar under better control because those are two what we call modifiable risks for not doing well after your joint right. replacement, right? Because right? we want you to do really well after that. We don't want it to get infected or any of those things. But um, having poor dental health is also a modifiable risk factor. So again, I don't right. want somebody that maybe has the, the startings of um, an abscess or something like that in there that's not really hurting them yet. They may not even know anything's going on. Right. Go get this joint replaced and then wind up with a, a joint infection because just like you mentioned, that bacteria can kind of spill over into the bloodstream and it's going to set up its house wherever it finds something new. It's like that wasn't mm-hmm. that wasn't here. Um, I'm mm-hmm. gonna I'm gonna explore this area. Right. You know, right? And the odds, the chances of the frequency of these things happening is very low. Oh, absolutely, very low. But the devastating consequences, mm-hmm. if you're the one that it happens to, right very high on something that we could have prevented right uh because you know if you go through a joint replacement say a knee or you get a hip uh joint replaced who wants to go back and get that revised oh no not you not the surgeon not anybody who wants that to happen right, right because the first time through is your best right. chance for a great outcome right not an orthopedic surgeon, obviously but just in general that first time to do that is the best time to do mm-hmm. that because you have compromised results on anything right. you do if you're having to come back and work with an infected area all that it, it the result it's tough to get that really good result that second third fourth time yeah kind of thing and the, the flip of that is if you've had a procedure already like if you have a you know artificial heart valve or you have a joint replacement or uh, gosh, a stint or a pacemaker or any mm-hmm. of those different mm-hmm. kinds of things, make sure you're telling your dentist about that, right? right. It may or may not need anything done about it, right. but letting them know is important because if it's fresh-ish, right, like mm-hmm. it hasn't been in for very long, I think you told me usually under a year, um, somewhere around in there, yeah, that's we, definitely, we definitely going to need some antibiotics we probably. We get a little squeamish yeah. at less than a year. And that's also a conversation to have with your physician um, because we can take two different types of joint replacements here. Let's say uh, you've got the young person that uh, had a car accident. Yeah, traumatic injury or something. Traumatic problem. And and they've got – now they've got metallic items in their joint that they didn't have before. But they're healthy. Not a lot of bad habits. Okay, great. They have their conversation with their orthopedic surgeon. All right, when I go see the dentist and I get my teeth cleaned, do, do I, I need, need, yeah, do do I I need antibiotic. antibiotic prophylaxis? Yes or no? And if so, for how long? Other patient, and I'm going to kind of skew. Skew the other way. Yep, right. we're going to steer in the skid hard. Okay, more mature patient, poor diabetic control, history of complications post-surgically in other areas of the body. Um, You know... We're I've, absolutely going to give you some antibiotics from that. Standpoint. I've got a couple of yeah. patients that have had joint replacements where the surgeon says, I get it. It's over a year. But if we try and go back, right? what this patient's looking at is a wheelchair. Right. So I understand what the guidelines say. Right. I still would like for right. you to use right. antibiotic prophylaxis because, again, are the chances very high? No. The devastating outcomes... The right. consequences of a bad moment, somebody loses their mobility. Right, right. They lose independence, which is a huge subjective loss. Right, right. And, you know, you mentioned those guidelines and that, you know, it's important that for folks to know that we're not just making it up, right? There are sp- specific instances where antibiotics are always going to be indicated, especially um, uh, with some of your congenital heart defects, those kinds of things. Right. It doesn't matter how long the repair 
was or any of those kinds of things, those are usually always going to require antibiotics. But one that we used to always give antibiotics for, but is actually not guideline driven anymore, right. is mitral valve prolapse, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, and that's that's a lot of uh, patient education on our mm-hmm. part saying, you know, it's not considered a danger because mm-hmm. the flow disturbance uh, you think about it like the Mississippi River. Is there an eddy in the flow where the right. bacteria could collect in in the heart? So the, with mitral valve prolapse, they found that that's really not not happening. Mm-mm. Risk benefit ratio. It's just not something right. we give antibiotics for. Right. Um, with the orthopedic guidelines now, the the cardiac guidelines tend to come from the American Heart Association. Right. Uh, can be found on their website. Uh, orthopedic surgeons. Uh, they, I really lean on them for guidance mm-hmm. on if this were to go south, how bad is, how far south is south right? Um, type thing. If they're thinking, oh, it's a healthy individual, X, Y, Z, right. or I, I really, I, I don't know if we can go back and revise that. We're yeah. on kind of our last chance yeah. here. Then that's going to. That's going to push the needle one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Josie Bidwell, and you're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Mark Livingston, and we've been talking all about uh, your teeth and your oral care today. And we do have a caller on the line, so before we dig into the last thing we were going to talk about, let's go see how we can help uh, Linda in Port Gibson. Good morning. How can I help you? Yes, uh, I like the uh, doctor to talk about um, getting a dental implant and diabetes. Gotcha. Because uh, I've heard some people say that uh, they kind of discourage people getting dental implants if they got diabetes. All right. What do we say, Dr. Livingston? Sure. Um, As with most surgeries with the diabetic patient, if they have good long-term chronic control of their diabetes, then they would be a potential candidate for an implant. Now, there are other variables involved. How much bone is in the area you need the implant, so forth, so on. So how invasive a procedure are we talking about is one of the variables. Now, poorly controlled diabetics, we do tend to say, I'm sorry, but Mm. you're not a good candidate because the failure rate is so high. So you go through a procedure. You spend your money, and you wind up losing the implant anyway. Gotcha. So glycemic control, control of the diabetes is uh, a big issue there. Also, same, same um, smokers. Mm -hmm. uh, That tends to be, that tends to set us up for failure if we have a heavy smoker as well for uh, pushing people toward or away from dental implants. Yep. All right, Miss Linda, I hope that helped you out there. And thank you so much for giving us a call this morning. All right, Mark, uh, in the last couple of minutes of the show, I know that there is a population of patients that you work with that are very kind of near and dear to your heart um, that often, I think, probably shy away from going to the dentist because maybe they've had a bad experience in the past or we just think this is going to be too much too much trouble or too much stress. Um, And that is folks that have some cognitive impairment or would fall in that special needs category Um, because it it can be stressful for anybody going to the dentist. And when you, you know, sometimes uh, interact with the world in a little different way, it can be doubly scary for that. Absolutely. And, Mm -hmm. and not to make light of it, but we just, you don't know what set of goggles they're looking at the world through. Right. And what's going to be scary to them. May be nothing to us, and what may be scary for us, they don't even recognize right. as being scary. So it's you're all over the map. But yes, the adult special needs, cognitively impaired people. Uh, let's see, this coming August, I will have been at the U for 27 years. So that's how long uh, this going down this particular rabbit hole mm-hmm. has been. And yes, it's you know it, it's one of the things. Um, not to be too sappy about the whole thing, but you know, what gets you up in the morning? Yeah. What, what, if you're looking back on your career and you're going, did I make a difference? This is one of those times where you go, yeah. Uh huh. I yeah, know exactly yeah, what yeah. you're talking about. There are those yeah. things that make you get up and lace your shoes up every day and come exactly. on, come on to work. Exactly. Um, we are one of the few places where the adult, now there are a lot of pediatric dentists that take uh, the younger patients to the operating room right. for care. 
we're our group is one of the few that does general dentistry for an adult special needs population and so it's really tough uh on on the caregiver whether they be a parent or people from a facility you're taking someone to the dentist you you've got to show up early for the operating room you're right. probably gonna to have to stay late because it's going to take as long as it's going to take to do the procedures that we do the cleaning the fillings etc and then they've got to go to post anesthesia care um, to allow them to wake up to a point where our anesthesiology colleagues feel comfortable releasing them into right. someone's care to go back home so yeah to, just seeing all those patients and it's just um, it is very humbling mm -hmm. you know we had to spend a lot of brain power and a lot of time to get where we are in life mm -hmm. okay takes a lot of dedication. The dedication I see out of uh, these caregivers makes it look like, what did I ever do with my life? Right. Uh, you know, they're, it's 24-7, 365, Christmas Day, all the time, and it is very, very humbling. Uh, it's it's imp an amazing, I mean, you know, uh, watching some of the uh, movies yesterday, they had some of the superhero movies on yesterday afternoon. And I was thinking, yeah, think, thinking forward to this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I've met a bunch of superheroes myself. Yeah. Uh, to, to Those do everyday the, heroes taking care of these folks. Holy yeah. smoke, man. Uh, just un unbelievable. Uh, I, I, I really look forward to seeing these patients. I realize it's going to be challenging, but a lot of times it's so much fun. When you see them kind of get used to you seeing you, right? and now it's not, yeah, you may still need to go to the operating room to do the bigger procedures or do a lot of the smaller procedures, but when they come to see you, and, you know, as I was telling you earlier, uh, uh, I've gotten a nickname from one of my patients, uh, Tigger. Uh, which I find just incredibly amusing. And y'all can't I, tell, but he's got red hair, so it makes sense. Right, and and if I get excited, I may bounce on the balls of my feet a little bit. <laughs> he does do that. So uh, where some people will be like, well, you know, I'm I'm Dr. Livingston. I shouldn't be referred to as Tigger. I'm going, hey, they feel comfortable. Right. They're associating me with something pleasant right. in life versus something not you know, if, if I'd have been called Eeyore, okay, we're, we're going to have to circle back and maybe rethink how you're seeing yes, me here. Yes. Um, but, but it's just been so much fun. Okay? Yep. Uh, and last, if I may, just Absolutely. a couple of th people that make this thing work for us. Yes. First, my departmental faculty, Dr. Rose, Dr. Ruiz, Dr. Asbill, Dr. Nelson, and Dr. Sawoya. These They're fantastic. They're amazing, yeah. okay? It is so not a one-man show, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, please forgive me if that appeared to be what it seemed like earlier in the broadcast. It is not. It is an amazing group of people, our staff, everything. Uh, also, fire a flare-out in the direction of the Department of Anesthesia at UMC. Dr. Aurora, your team is amazing. God bless y'all. Um, the work you do with our patients, helping us get them care, can't put a monetary value on it. And last but not least, all the caregivers for all these patients we've talked about today, um, your angels walking amongst us, thank you. You do a super job. Never let anybody tell you any different. Well, and thank you, Dr. Livingston, because I know you love what you do and your passion shows through there. All right, guys, if you didn't get your question in today, you can always email me, fit at mpbonline.org. You've been listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.